Robert Cooper. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Well, let's start off by doing something serious like going for a beer. <laughs> he finds himself sitting in the neighborhood bar drinking a beer at about the same time that he began to think about going there for one. In fact, he has finished it. <coughs> Perhaps he'll have a second one, he thinks, as he downs it and asks for a third. There's a young woman sitting not far from him who's not exactly good looking, but good looking enough and probably good in bed as indeed she is. Did he finish his beer? Can't remember. What really matters is, did he enjoy his orgasm or even have one. This he is wondering on his way home through the foggy night streets from the young woman's apartment, which was full of Cupid dolls, the sort won at carnivals, and they made a date, as he recalls, uh, to go to one, where she wins another. She has a knack for it, whereupon they're in her apartment again, taking their clothes off, she excitedly cuddling her new doll in a bed heaped with them. He can't remember when he last slept, and he's no longer sure as he staggers through the night streets, still foggy, where his own apartment is, his orgasm, if he had one, already fading from memory. Maybe he should take her back to the carnival, he thinks, where she wins another Cupid doll. This is at least their second date, maybe their fourth, and this time they go for a romantic nightcap at the bar where they first met, where a brawny dude starts hassling her. He intervenes, and she turns up at his hospital bed, bringing him one of her Cupid dolls to keep him company, which is her way of expressing the bond between them, or so he supposes, as he leaves the hospital on crutches, uncertain what part of town he is in or what part of the year. He decides it's time to call the affair off. She's driving him crazy. But then the brawny dude turns up at their wedding and apologizes for the pounding he gave him. <laughs> he didn't realize, he says, how serious they were. The guy's wedding present is a gift for certificate for two free drinks at the bar where they met <laughs> and a pair of white satin ribbons for his crutches. During the ceremony, they both carry Cupid dolls that probably have some barely hidden significance, and indeed do. The child she bears him, his or another's, reminds him, as if he needed reminding, that time is fast moving on. He has responsibilities now, and he decides to check whether he still has the job that he had when he first met her. He does. His absence, if he has been absent, is not remarked on, but he is not congratulated on his marriage either. No doubt because, it comes back to him now, before he met his wife, he was engaged to one of his colleagues, and their co-workers had already thrown them an engagement par party, so they must resent the money they spent on gifts. It's embarrassing, and the atmosphere is somewhat hostile, but he has a child in kindergarten and another on the way, so what can he do? Well, he still hadn't cashed in the gift certificate, so for one thing, what the hell, he can go for a beer. Two, in fact, and he can afford a third. There's a young woman sitting near him who looks like she's probably good in bed, but she's not his wife, and he has no desire to commit adultery. Or so he tells himself as he sits on the edge of her bed with his pants around his ankles. Is he taking them off or putting them on? He's not sure, but now he pulls them on and limps home, having left his beribboned crutches somewhere. On arrival, he finds all the Cupid dolls, which were put on a shelf when the babies started coming, now scattered about the apartment, beheaded and with their limbs amputated. One of the babies is crying, so while he warms up a bottle of milk on the stove, he goes into its room to give it a pacifier and discovers a note from his wife pinned to its pajamas, which says that she's gone off to the hospital to have another baby and she better not find him here when she gets back because if she does, she'll kill him. He believes her. So he's soon out on the streets again, wondering if he ever gave that bottle to the baby or if it's still boiling away on a stove. He passes the old neighborhood bar and is tempted, but decides he's had enough trouble for one lifetime, and he's about to walk on when he's stopped by that hook who beat him up and who now gives him a cigar because he's just become a father and drags him into the bar for a celebratory drink, or rather several, he's lost count. 
The celebrations are already over, however, and the new father, who has married the same woman who threw him out, is crying in his beer about the miseries of married life and congratulating him on being well out of it, a lucky man. But he doesn't feel lucky, especially when he sees a young woman sitting near them who looks like she's probably good in bed and decides to suggest they go to her place, but too late she's already out the door with the guy who beat him up and stole his wife. So he has another beer wondering where he's supposed to live now, and realizing it's the bartender who so remarks while offering him another on the house, that life is short and brutal, and before he knows it, he'll be dead. Well, the guy's right. After a few more beers and orgasms, some vaguely remembered, most not, one of his sons, now a race car driver and the president of the company he used to work for, comes to visit him on his deathbed. And apologizing for arriving so late, I went for a beer, Dad, things happened, <laughs> says he's going to miss him, but it's probably for the best. <laughs> for the best what, he asks, but his son is gone, if he was ever there in the first place. Well, you know, life, he says to the nurse, who's come to pull the sheet over his face and wheel him away. That was a little New Yorker story for everything else. So I've always been interested in new things, partly because I distrusted the old things and I, I, uh, my earliest writing experiences were to confront the old things and see what could be done with them. So uh, one day this story just appeared. She attempted, he urging her on, the new thing. The old thing had served them well, but they were tired of it, more than tired. Had the old thing ever been new? Uh, perhaps, but not in their experience of it. For them, it was always the old thing. Sometimes a good old thing, other times just the old thing. They're like air or stones, part, so to speak, of the furniture of the world into which they had moved and from which, sooner or later, they would move out. It was not at first obvious to them that this world had room for a new thing, it being the nature of old things to display themselves or to be displayed in timeless, immutable patterns. Later they'd ask themselves why this was so, the question not occurring to them until she had attempted the new thing, and, but for now the old question that they, the only question that they asked, he asked it actually, when she suggested it was, why not? A fateful choice, though not so lightly taken as his reply may make it seem, for both had come to view the old thing not merely as old or even dead, but as a kind of alive or dead ancestral curse, inhibitory and perverse and ripe for challenge, impossible or even unimaginable, though the new thing seemed until she tried it. And then, when with such success she did, her novelty responding to his appetite for it, the new thing displaced the old thing overnight. Well, not literally, of course, the old thing remained, but cast now into shadow as the furniture of the world, shifting without shifting, lost its familiar arrangements. The old thing was still the old thing, the world was still the old, still the world, the, its furniture, the furniture. Yet nothing was the same, nor would it ever be they knew again. It felt, though as in a dream, so transformed was everything, like waking up. This was exhilarating, his word, liberating, hers, and greatly enhanced their delight. She whooped, he giggled, this was fun in the new thing, which they both enjoyed as much and as often as they could. Indeed, for a time, it filled their lives, deliciously altering perception, dissolving habit, bringing them ever closer together, illuminating what was once obscure while making what before was ordinary now seem dark and alien. This was the power of the new thing. And also, they knew this from the outset, its inherent peril. The new thing, being truly new, not merely a rearrangement of the old, removed the ground upon which even the new thing itself might stand. The old thing's preclusive patterns were like those frail stilts that floodplains housing was erected on. The new thing joined forces with the cleansing flood, as did they in their unbound joy, having anticipated all this from the start, though perhaps not guessing then 
how close together delight and terror lay, nor back then considering as she he urging made the new thing happen, how indifferent to their new creation would be both world and thing. Indifferent but not untouched, all shook and they the shakers were not themselves unshaken. This too even trembling they ardently embraced, though perhaps they whooped and giggled less. Scary, she laughed, reaching for him, and he clinging to her and thinking as he fell that some principle must be at stake, something to do with time, cause, and motion perhaps, so much the better. Thus, even if somewhat apprehensively in such an altered yet indifferent world, they found pleasure in what might in others inspire dread, their own apprehension mitigated by their shared delight in this new thing, their delight dampened less by antique fears of being swept away in metaphoric floods than by their awareness that the new thing did not, could not know them, nor would or could the world in which they had brought it into being. The new thing, which was theirs, was, alas, not really theirs at all, nor could it ever be. Moreover, his logic, her logic this, they had chosen the new thing, chose it still. But with the old thing lost from view, what choice was theirs in truth? Were they not, in fact, the chosen? And his reply, huh, let's go back to the old thing, just for fun, and see. And did they? Could they? Of course. The old thing was waiting there for them, as though neither they nor it had ever gone away. Like an old shirt left to yellow in the closet, an abandoned habit, a lost friend discovered in a crowd. And they found new pleasure in returning to it, or at least comfort, and something like reconciliation with the entrenched and patterned ways of the world. The old thing reminds me of my childhood, he acknowledged gratefully, and she why this appetite for novelty anyway? When we're here so briefly, we don't even have time to exhaust the old. Thus, they enjoyed the old thing anew, and in ways they had not done before, chiefly by way of ceasing all resistance, and they told themselves that they were pleased. Of course, they had to admit, after knowing the new thing, it was not quite the same thing, the old thing. Sort of like dried fruit, she said, sweet and chewy now, but not so juicy as before. He agreed, more like body than person, you might say, more carcass than body. They experimented, giving the old thing a new wrinkle or two, but they could not sustain their revived interest in it. It was still the old thing, and it still oppressed them. Back to the new thing which was still there and was delightful and exhilarating as before. They were pleased, did not have to tell themselves they were. What fun, truly! But the new thing, like the old thing, no matter how at first they denied this to each other, was also not the same as it had been before. He the first to admit it when regret, bat-like, flickered briefly across her brow. No, she objected, falsely brightening. It is not it, but we who have changed. By going back to the old thing. Yes, you were right in the first place, he said. We were not free to choose. But we cannot go back to the new thing either. No, she agreed. We must try a new, new thing. And so they did. And again, beginning to get the hang of this new thing thing, they found joy and satisfaction and close accord with one another. Out with old things and old new things too. They laughed, falling about in their world-shaking pleasure. But was this delight in the new, new thing as intense as that they'd felt when they'd first tried the old, new thing? No, they couldn't fool themselves far from it. So when the new, new thing bumped up provocatively against the old, new thing, they were filled with doubt and confusion and no longer knew which of the two they most desired or should desire if either. Out of their uncertainties came another new thing, the, his handiwork this time, momentarily delightful and distracting, but soon enough this too was replaced by yet another, now hers, itself as soon displaced. Both now were separately busy at what had become more task than pleasure, the devising of new things now mostly what they did. By now even the new thing's newness was in question. I am lost she gasped, falling to her knees. He called out to her from across the room, I felt oppressed by the old thing, now I feel oppressed by the new. 
This is probably, she said, speaking to him by telephone, just the way of the insensate world. We were fooled yet again. No, no, I can't accept that, he replied by mail, else no new thing is a new thing at all. His letter crossed with hers, which said, my unquenchable appetite for novelty is matched only by my unquenchable appetite for understanding. What a clown. I'm deeply sorry, adding, I have now become a collector of old things. There's not much fun in them, but there is satisfaction. <laughs> but wait, he wrote in his diary, does not the invention of one new thing insist by definition upon a second and a third, a fourth? And indeed, is this not, in fact, this sequential generation of new things, the real new thing that we have made? And is that not delightful? He thought if he tore this diary entry out and sent it to her, he might well see her again, and they could have fun in their old new things way. But the time for all that was itself an old thing now, and anyway, he no longer knew now after the flood where in the world she was. I brought along this, but I'm not going to read from it. This is my first book of stories. It was, um, was a book called Prick Songs and Descants. It's now out in the Penguin Classic series with a few other books of mine. Uh, and that's been kind of that <coughs> persistent love all through the large books and the novellas and the huge things that I'm working on now to continue to play with form and confront the kind of history of the form and find new ways to express myself. And uh, that was the kind of lead, lead one, that's 69. And uh, since then, there have been a set of stories. He mentioned the, the sequences. And um, uh, the last one uh, that has been published, but not the last one that I've got a huge bunch. In fact, these two things I just read belong to the next set, is The Child Again. I'm going to finish with a story from there. But because noir is on the posters, yeah. I thought I'd better at least um, read something from it. Um, this is just a little sidebar story. Noir is a, is a Philip M. Noir is his name. Now, the M is never said, but it's called a family name, so anybody can guess it. And um, he uh, has a visit from a a woman, a widow, who's wanting to find out if her, how her husband was killed, presumably. It's one of those bizarre kind of com complex tales, noir tale type tales. And uh, this was my, after my play with the uh, Western myth in Ghost Town, this was my play with the American urban myth. <coughs> but uh, early in the book, he, after, uh, he's chasing, he, the, 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 the widow seemingly has been killed, but the uh, body has disappeared, and he's kind of chasing that down, trying to find clues for it. He ends up in this um, uh, seafront dive, um, Skipper's Waterfront Saloon, a smoky low-life dive the cops call the Dead End Cafe. They've hauled so many stiffs out of here. And um, in there, there's a, a prostitute called Michiko, and she stops him at the door when he's leaving because she recognizes that the cops are also in there, are sending some guys out to meet him out front when he gets out there and he's got to go out the back door. So the way she does it was asking him to come back. She says, uh, go out back door, feel son. Somebody waiting for you in front. Come on, baby, she says more loudly, reaching into your pants. Quickie, quickie, Michiko love you. Michiko was not always a suffocatingly perfumed bag of old painted bones. She got a lot of tattoos. She had a certain enigmatic Eastern aura when she was younger and worked the snazzier joints. Before that, while she was still just a kid in schoolgirl clothes and white cotton panties, white panties used to be a big deal, you miss those times, she had been the mall of a notorious Yakuza gangster who had his own portrait tattooed on the in, inside of her tender young thighs, where he could keep an eye on things, he said. 
A rival gang leader kidnapped her and blinded the portrait with red splotches and just for good measure added a mustache and blacked out two of the teeth before returning her to her lover. He also had his own hand, recognizable by its don't fuck with me dragon tattoo on the back and the superhero code ring on his pinky, tattooed over her plucked pubes, the middle finger disappearing between her lips. Her lover responded by sending her back to the rival with the dragon tattoo reduced to a simpering please fuck me position, the ring finger chopped to a bloody stub signifying a humiliating three-knuckled jubitsumi and the middle finger blackened as though torched by its impertinence. The lover also tattooed Michiko's ears with haikus celebrating the black mist of summer and winter's ice heart, which was a play on his own name, and inked the circles of a target on her buttocks around the bullseye anus with the phrase, you're next, asshole, on the right cheek. The rival was not dismayed. With a simple stroke, he changed Winter's Ice Heart to Winter's Withered Dick, which also turned out to be a play on the lover's name. Assumed the asshole could be either of them, so merely added a semi-automatic weapon on her left cheek with his gang's insignia on the handle. On her face, he tattooed a snake, the head coiling out of one ear onto Michiko's upper lip, its mouth biting its own tail, which was coiling out of the other ear, the face of a snake, the por a portrait of the lover, the tail, the lover's own cock, which was famously a favorite subject of tabloids, tattooed with the kanji symbols for king of water business. Thus, this the rival subtly altered to king of urine business and sent her back again. The lover accepted the biting snake, but put a face on the bitten tail with very big ears, mocking the rival's donkey ears, which he always tried to keep pinned under his black fedora. Mr. Hee Haw is what the cops called him, and they loved to humiliate him by knocking his hat off, and applied the kanji symbols for number one hot-ass warrior to the head. Then, just for fun, he loved her after all and wished her to be beautiful. He turned her breasts into magnificent mountainous landscapes with little bridges over streams that his own gang members posed on in their pinstripe suits holding up placards that read, Do not dream mountains from anthills, pissant. The scene invited interpolations and the rival obliged by turning it into a classic Yakuza bloodbath with his own gang disguised as giant ants in black fedoras and suits wiping out the lover's gang. He decorated her belly with a bulbous raccoon dog with testicles like beach balls, etched a crimson four on her forehead, the sign of death, inscribed a stormy seascape on her backside with giant waves crashing over the small of her back, and converted the target into a whirlpool with a fishing boat being dragged down into its dark center, giving one the sense, if one approached her from that direction, of entering the eye of the storm. Thus, she continued to get passed back and forth between the two Yakuza bosses as a kind of message board. The gangsters coming to so admire each other's art in the end that, ri that their rivalry to the disgust of, that their, their rivalry to the disgust of all their gang members became purely an artistic epistolary one. They covered her with fragments of famous scenic and erotic masterpieces, always with implicit or explicit threats and insults, burned the signs of the zodiac in the appropriate places on her body, inscribed four centuries of Yakuza history in all the blank spaces covering even the soles of her feet, her lips and scalp, her eyelids and armpits. So obsessed were they, they might have started working on her insides had not their own lieutenants organized a public exhibit of Michiko in the city's modern art museum, and at the moment that they both bowed to one another, executed both of them with tattoo needles fired into their ears. Michiko, meanwhile, ended up tattooed from crown to toes with layers of exotic overwritten graffiti, a veritable Yakuza textbook, slang dictionary, and art gallery, a condition that served her well in her subsequent career once the museum, which claimed ownership of her, was paid off. She was worth a C-note just for an hour of library time. All of it fading now, losing its contours, its clarity, the colors muddying, wrinkles disturbing the continuities, obscuring the detail, suffering the fate of all history, which is only corruptible memory. Time passes, nothing stays the same, a sad thing, a haiku somewhere on her body says as much. 
Okay, this is um, a book of uh, tales called A Child Again, and it relates to um, uh, either children's themes or children's stories. There are puzzles in here that incidentally have not yet been solved, uh, and there are, uh, um, it, on the back, there's a story told in uh, not a deck of cards, but the heart suit of cards. And these are shuffleable, so you can read the story in various ways. And um, there's uh, a lot of tales that uh, move directly out of fairy tales and, or, or tales that are told to children. Uh, just ch things children do are in here. That little story read this afternoon called Nymph Light could have appeared in here. So, for example, it starts with uh, Sir John Paper returning to Honolulu as an old guy uh, trying to look up his old friend Puff. What I'm going to read is to finish off here, although I have more of noir if anybody wants more of that, is a story called The Invisible Man. The Invisible Man gave up his life as a crime fighter. It was too hard, and no one cared enough, and became a voyeur. A thief, a bugaboo, a prowler and pickpocket, a manipulator of events. It was more fun, and people paid more attention to him. He began inhabiting horse tracks, women's locker rooms, extravagant festivities, bank vaults, altered uh, schoolyards, and centers of power. He emptied tills, altered votes, made off with purses and address books, leaked secrets, started up fights in subway cars and boardrooms took any CD, any empty CD you wanted on planes and trains, blew on the necks of naked women, moved pieces of game boards and gambling tables, made strange noises in dark bedrooms, tripped up politicians and pop stars on stage, and whispered perverse temptations in the ears of the pious. Theft was particularly easy, except for the problem of what to do with what he took. To be invisible, he had to be naked, and there were not too many places on or in his body where he could hide things which themselves were not invisible. And these places, notably his mouth and his rectum, which served as his overnight bag, so to speak, were often filled with other necessities. So, except for small jewelry store heists, which could be slipped in, he was generally limited to what he could hold in his closed fists or squeeze under his armpits or between his buttocks. His daily spoils comparable then to those of a common panhandler, from whom on bad days he sometimes also stole. Still, there was not much on which to spend his wealth. Whatever he wanted, he could simply take, and he could travel and live as, as and where he pleased, so he soon amassed a small fortune, and privy to all the inside information he needed, became a successful day trader on the side. Though drawn into a life of crime without remorse and tempted like anyone else to kill a few people while he was at it, he had no place to conceal a suitable weapon. Indeed, it would be dangerous if he tried. So his new career was necessarily limited to lesser felonies. felonies. Of course, he could discreetly misdirect the aim of others, but in fact, he steered clear of armed persons as well as reckless drivers, busy kitchens, operating rooms. He could still be hurt. Stray bullets could wound him, knives could prick. He was, not, he was only invisible, not immortal. And his insides were not invisible, his, excre his excretions weren't, his blood. What a sight, a wound in view and no wounded. Moreover, if wounded, who would heal him? Perhaps he could find a blind doctor, though probably there weren't many. And if he died, who would mourn him? Who would even see him there to bury him? He would become a kind of odd speed bump in the road for a month or two. Such were the handicaps of an invisible person, no matter how rich they were or how much secret mischief they enjoyed. He was also obliged to stay away from cold places. Though his nakedness was apparent to no one and he himself was accustomed to it, it was a reality he could not ignore. Cold winds drove him inside, air conditioning out. Sometimes to warm himself or to conduct some business or other, such as fencing his stolen goods or perhaps simply in response to a deep longing, he made himself visible with masks, wigs, and costumes. So as not to have to steal these things over and over, he bought a house to store them in and took up stamp and coin collecting and growing orchids on the side. 
There were many choices amongst his costumes, many characters he could be, and this added to his existential angst. Who was he, really? Without a costume, he was invisible even to himself. In the mirror, he could see no more than anyone else could see, a blurry nothingness where something should be. You are a beautiful person, he would say to it, more as an instruction than a comment. When costuming himself, he had to dress carefully from head to toe. One day, he forgot his socks and caused something of a sensation when taking his seat on the subway. Sorry, uh, a, a kind of cancer, he explained to people, staring aghast at his missing ankles. Fully aware, he exited hastily at the next stop, that the mouth on the mask was not moving. On another day, in a crowded elevator, when visible, he loved to mingle with the human masses, feel the body contact, something that usually had to be avoided when invisible. His scarf fell off, which was even worse. A woman fainted, and the other passengers all shrank back. It's just a trick, he chuckled, behind the deadpan mask, which no doubt appeared to them to be floating in midair. He riffled a deck of cards enigmatically in his gloved hands, and when the door opened, he turned his empty eyes upon them to mesmerize them long enough to make his escape. After that, he took to wearing bodysuits as the first layer, a kind of undercoat, much as he hated getting in and out of them. Mostly, though, he went naked and unseen, committing his crimes, indulging himself in his manipulative and voyeuristic pleasures. Women fascinated him, and he loved watching them do their private things, frustrating, frustrating as it was at times not to participate. Even when they were most exposed, they remained unfathomably mysterious to him and an unending delight. And it was one day while hanging out in the ladies' room of a grand hotel during a hairdresser's convention that when things were slow, he stepped into a stall and raised the seat to relieve himself, only to have the door open behind him and the seat lower itself again, and he knew then that he was not alone in his invisibility. Was she, he assumed she, sitting on the seat, or was this merely a gender signal and a warning? Taking no chances, he backed out silently, the opening and closing of the stall door no doubt telling her all she needed to know. After that, he began to feel pursued. Perhaps she'd been following him for some time and he hadn't noticed. Now he seemed to sense her there whether she was or not, and whether or not he had to consider his every move as if she were. She might still be an active crime fighter, just waiting to apprehend him or to avenge some crime that he'd committed in the past. He retreated from more than one burglary, sensing her presence in the room, and sometimes it seemed there was another hand in the pocket he was trying to pick. He watched the women on the street carefully in case she, like he, occasionally made herself visible, and they all appeared to him to be wearing masks. He was jostled by absences, felt a hot breath often on his neck. His income dropped off sharply, and he was even inhibited from acquiring his daily necessities. Her pro possible proximity made him self-conscious about his personal hygiene and interfered with his voyeuristic routines. He felt especially vulnerable inside his own house and went there less often, with the consequence that the food in his refrigerator spoiled and his orchids died. How did she know where he was if she couldn't see him? By following the clues the invisible always leave behind, footprints in the mud, snow, of course he never walked in snow, and sand, bodily excretions, fingerprints, he couldn't wear gloves nor carry them without getting them messy, discarded costumes and toothbrushes, mattress indentations, floating objects, swirling dust, fogged windows. She could watch for places where the rain did not fall and listen for the noises his body made. He had always stumbled over things. Now he could not be sure she was not placing those things in his path to expose him. So just moving about was like negotiating a minefield. He had to eat more surreptitiously, not to exhibit the food flying about before vanishing. And so ate too fast, giving himself heartburn. But when he started to steal a packet of antacids, he thought he saw it move as he reached for it. Then it occurred to him one day that she might not be a crime fighter after all, merely another lonely, invisible person seeking company. And as soon as he had that thought, she disappeared, or seemed to. He should have felt relieved, but he did not. He found that he missed her. Though she'd not exactly been friendly, she was the nearest thing to a friend he'd ever had. 
He went back to where they'd first met and raised and lowered the toilet seat, but there was no response. He should have spoken up that day. He did now. Are you there? He whispered. No reply, though the lady in the next stall asked, Did you say something? No, no dear, just a <clears throat> frog in the throat, he wheezed in a cracking falsetto, then flushed quickly and swung the door open and closed before the woman could get up from where she was sitting and peek in. But he remained in the stall for a time, reflecting on how something so ordinary as a toilet seat can be transformed suddenly into something extraordinary and, well, beautiful. Now he left clues everywhere and committed crimes more daring than before. If she was a crime fighter, he wanted to be arrested by her. If she was not, well, they could be partners. She even had more room to hide things. They could tackle bigger jobs. As he moved about, he swung his arms freely, hoping to knock into something that did not seem to be there but caused only unfortunate accidents and misdirected anger. Twice he got shot at in the dark. He figured it was a small price to pay. Perhaps if he were hurt, she'd feel pity for him and make herself known. He began to see her even in her invisibility as unutterably beautiful, and he realized that he was hopelessly in love. He thought of his adoration of her as pure and noble, utterly unlike his life in crime. But he also imagined making mad, impetuous love to her, rolling about ecstatically in their indentations. Nothing he'd seen in his invisible powder room prowl excited him more than these imaginings. Still, for all his hopes, she gave no further evidence of her existence. In his house, he left messages on the mirrors, Take me, I'm yours. But the messages sat there, unanswered, unaltered. When he looked in the mirrors past the lettering, he could not see his cheeks, but he could see the tears sliding down them. His love life, once frivolous, had turned tragic, and it was all his fault. Why had he never touched her? A fool, a fool. He was in despair. He hung out in bars more often, drinking other people's drinks. He got sick once and threw up beside a singing drunk, peeing against a wall, sobering the poor man up instantly. <laughs> he knew that rumors about him were beginning to spread, but what did it matter? Without her, his life was meaningless. It had not been very meaningful before she came into it, but now it was completely empty. Even crime bored him. Voyeurism did. What did he care about visible bodies when he was obsessed by an invisible one? He tried to find some reason for going on. Over the years, he'd been collecting a set of antique silverware from one family, a piece at a time. He decided to finish the set. He didn't really want the silverware, but it gave him something to do. He successfully picked up another couple of pieces operating recklessly in broad daylight, but then went back one time too many, and with a soup spoon up his ass, got bit on the shins by a watchdog the family had bought to try to catch the silverware thief. He got away, doing rather serious damage to the dog. And in effect, it ate the soup spoon. But he bled all the way home. He supposed they'd follow the trail. Didn't care if they did, but they didn't. Maybe they were satisfied not to lose the spoon. But the wound was slow to heal, and he couldn't go about with it or the bandage on it exposed. So he donned the costume of an old man. He was an old man and spent his days in cheap coffee shops, feeling sorry for himself and mooning over his lost love. He went on doing this even after the dog bite had healed, drawn to coffee shops with sad songs on their sound systems. He no longer stole, but bought most of what he needed, which was little, but now included mat reading materials for his coffee shop life. He avoided newspapers and magazines, preferring old novels from vanished times, mostly those written by women, all of whom he tended to think of as beautiful and invisible. He would sometimes sit all day over a single page, letting his mind drift, muttering softly to himself, or more or less to himself, all the things he should have said when she was still in his life. Then one day he saw, sitting at another table, all so greatly aged, an old police captain he used to work with back in his crime-fighting days. He made himself known to him. The captain did not look surprised. Perhaps he'd been tailing him and asked him how things were going down at the station. Since you left, invisible man, said the officer, things have gone from bad to worse. You became something of a nuisance to us when you took up your new career, but it was a decision we could understand and make allowances for. 
Now there are gangs of invisible people out there committing heinous crimes that threaten to destroy the very fabric of our civilization. The invisible man stroked his false beard thoughtfully. And uh, since I stopped being a crime fighter, have you had help from any other person like myself? No, until these new gangs came along, you were unique in my experience, invisible man. So, he thought, she might be among them. It's why we're turning to you now. We're asking you to come back to the force, invisible man. We need you to infiltrate these gangs and help us stop them before it's too late. You're asking me to turn against my own people, he said somewhat pretentiously, for in truth, he never thought of himself as having people. <laughs> These aren't your people, invisible man. It's a whole new breed. They create fields of invisibility, so even their clothing and weapons and everything they steal is made invisible when it enters it. And now they're into bomb making. Oh, this was serious, all right. But he was thinking about his beloved his former beloved. He understood now that she might have been trying to recruit him for her gang, but it found him unworthy, and he felt hurt by that. They think of you as old-fashioned, invisible man, and have said some very unflattering things about you, in particular about your personal habits, of which, of course, I know nothing. But they also look up to you as a kind of pioneer, and though their power is greater than yours, their technology is less reliable. They've suffered catastrophic system crashes, and we want them to suffer a few more. It's a dangerous job, invisible man, but you're the only one we know who can handle it. So, once again, he took up his old life as a crime fighter, but under cover of renewed criminality, drifting somewhat cynically through the city in his old invisible skin, targeting the city fathers for his burglaries and vandalisms, dropping inflammatory notes to draw attention to himself, and even with the help of the captain blowing up the captain's own car, which he said was anyway in need of extensive clutch and transmission repair, so he was glad to get rid of it. In short, <laughs> making himself available, waiting to be contacted. Would she be among them? He felt misunderstood by her, undervalued, and in some odd way misused, a victim of love, which he no longer believed in, even while still in the grip of its unseen power. And if he found her again, would he crash her system? Or would she succeed in seducing him into the gang's nefarious activities? Who knows? He decided to keep an open mind about it. The future was no easier to see than he was. Thank you. Is that good enough? Yeah. That, that, <laughs> that, that was good enough. I've got a presidential campaign thing I could do. You want to hear it? It's short. It's a bad, we're into the season. I was just thinking, I thought of doing it anyway. Well, might as well. We'll I was thinking of doing it anyway soccer. because it's the season for this. And, might and, as well. And, uh, <laughs> And we got a. Okay, this is the president, and this is about fifties in a way, about the fifty states. Okay. The electoral season. How delightful it is, when the quadrennium is in bloom and our party-colored presidents arrive to spangle the fields and factory floors. Welcome visitants, they always are, low forms of existence though they be. The presidents are come, the children cry, and rush out to be hugged and kissed and have their photos taken with these singular creatures, half blind yet sensitive to the least hoot and twitter, elusive yet omnipresent, and even when repulsive, endowed with such curious instincts and so diverse in form and structure as to attract the attention of the most jaded observer, even if only in self-defense. The presidents are come. Yes, it sends a thrill through the heart, whether of pleasure or of apprehension, to see, after the long, dry years of stagnation and dormancy, the first one of the season, sailing in on broad, silphic pinions in the cool, slanted beams of a calm autumn morning, or else traversing the surface of the earth by those remarkable leaps and wriggles for which they are renowned. 
Some are gloriously bedizened, others naked, but for a film of gelatinous flesh, so tightly stretched as to be reduced to an invisible tenuity. Still others are soft, plump, pale, and woolly, or else a livid gray-green with hideous tail pustules, or tender, white, and tantalizingly delicate. And there are many, more familiar to the electorate, perhaps, which are actually capable of altering their external shape and changing their spots and colors, even as they busily slither, flutter, and honk. While it's true that the common consent of mankind regards most of these creatures with revulsion and abhorrence, and not without reason, inasmuch as many of them are more or less noxious, and no, some of them are terribly fatal to their fellows, monstrosities by excess are not uncommon, being rapacious and vindictive, treacherous and cruel even to their own kind, full of stratagem and artifice, highly venomous, lurking in darkness, endowed with curious instincts, feeding off excreta and furnished with many accessory means for the capture and destruction of their opponents, it must nevertheless be remembered always that even these vile creatures are the handiwork of infinite wisdom and so worthy of our admiration, however distant and guarded, our scrutiny must for our own safety be. Such scrutiny is invariably rewarded, for the presidents are curious beings in many respects. Though more or less inactive for most of their lives, they are nevertheless very enduring. They respire, respire little, are susceptible of hibernation, and can remain for a considerable time shut up in confinement so restricted as to produce astonishment. In their movements, they are lazy and half torpid, and yet are capable of sudden gestures, short and jerky and all too often lethal, even when perhaps not so men. When not frightened or running for election or both, they slowly crawl along with their tails and bellies dragging on the ground. They often stop and doze for a moment with closed eyes and hind legs spread out. Many of these creatures bear highly curious appendages that resemble trumpets in form and they emit incessant chattering sounds which simulate speech but which are mostly imitations of the cries of other species. <laughs> when they take an antipathy to anyone, they immediately show it. They suffer no rivals to approach them, but harass them ceaselessly, emitting rank screens of smoke and tearing from them the ballots that are their very sustenance. When a president has glutted itself, its crop, swelled by the votes that it has received, forms a voluminous projection in front of the neck. A fetid humor oozes from its nostrils and it remains sunk in a state of stupid torpor until the electoral outcome is finally determined, generally at the far end of the alimentary canal. If we were asked where throughout the world specimens were to be met with, we might reply almost everywhere, provided only that voters, a necessary nutrient, be present. But even where such prey is scarce, presidents have been detected and have moreover in their various mutations thrived. Darwin, in his famous voyage on the Beagle, was much struck by the curious phenomena of, and of distribution and survival which that voyage brought before his eyes, remarking that while some classes die out, as civilization spreads. Others, like the rats, the common sparrow, the presidents, the cockroaches, some parasites, and so on, adjust themselves to altered conditions and prosper under civilization as they never did in former days. Warm and temperate climates with abundant moisture are the localities favorable to all the presidents. They're said to live chiefly in ditches, especially those where stagnant and corrupt water has lain a long time, but they're also found in dung heaps, caves, swamps, and other obscure and fetid locations, choosing secret places wherein to store up all that tempts their cupidity or excites their covetousness, whether in or out of the zoo. Certainly, wherever else they might be found, they're nowhere more abundant than in America. Civilization's gem and nature's pride, as is widely acknowledged, especially by the gabbling and squawking presidents themselves and by their keepers. In America, presidents find a natural habitat, abundant in provender and mud, and congenial to their notorious reproductive habits. They are not, here at least, an endangered species. Indeed, well over 50 families or subspecies have been recorded, and it's probable that they are even more, much more numerous than this, as new discoveries are constantly rewarding the close examination of any particular locality with each new presidential season. 
The prickly candescent wind-up and comatose presidents, for example, are, for example, well known as are the inflatable president, sometimes referred to erroneously as the bouncing president, the savage blue-balled president, the infamous deviant quincuncial or conical president, and the nocturnal three-legged oblique president with his heavily lidded eyes and skin resembling inconsistent wetted parchment. The possibly uh, mythical flesh-colored presidents were said to have given birth to the homuncular beggar tick and revolving presidents, as well as to have sired the predacious boundless presidents, also known as the join the dots presidents, because of their tendency to lose their outline to their immediate surroundings. <laughs> it was this asexual yet fecund, fecund family of boundless presidents in its various evolutionary permutations that gave rise in our own times, not only to the mechanical abridged or bedside montage and car cartoon presidents, but also to the proliferation of multinational gathering and feeding stations and to intergalactic sporogenesis. None of this, however, has altered for the better their reputation. It's not clear why presidents should have been considered from the earliest ages as a symbol of stupidity and venality and branded with a stigma of infamy which will always cast an odium on their name. Many, to be sure, are by nature of a despotic and combative temperament, irascible and quarrelsome, living by plunder and bloodshedding, destruction the sole object of their existence. But the innocent, which arguably outnumber the noxious and are merely ridiculous, share their disrepute and are unjustly visited with the hatred and aversion due to their malefic fellows. Nor is this popular prejudice against the entire species moderated, alas, by any evidence of natural grace and beauty. It is difficult to comprehend why nature, while it has been so kind to the related families of athletes, gigolos, and starlets, has stamped the president with so ungainly a form. For most families of president, it must be said, are homely creatures, their physiognomy at once disproportionate and peculiarly threatening, and from their low facial angle, they do have a singularly witless appearance, making them objects of general repugnance and causing evil properties to be attributed to them. But these much despised beings are surely not so universally stupid or voracious as they are commonly said to be. In the present day, it's really time to have done with all these time-worn rhetorical fancies, which are in continual and complete variance with the results of science and observation, and to cry with the children, the presidents are come, hooray, don't get too close, but long live the presidents. <laughs> Okay. I think that says it all. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or anything that comes to mind? Uh, welcome to the big board. Glad to have you. Wow. I'm curious about your publishing, how you, you know, how you see where you publish, how do you deal with that? Like, do you want to go big? You know, Harper's, I mean, you, I, I see you go all over the place. You willfully. Uh, I guess we're in a room where publishing is the issue at uh, hand. Yes, well, that's a good place to talk about it, I guess. It's not something I like to talk about. Uh, well, the publishing world is a, is, a, is, a, is a corporate world on the whole. And so uh, when you think about the kind of success that allows us to remember the giants like Hemingway and Faulkner and so on. We think of this as all coming out of this very um, elite book world of New York and all the great presses that found these writers and made, made them into famous writers. And similarly with the, with the magazines that uh, in their various decades had this kind of power to, to uh, put a good stamp on, on, uh, on a writer. Um, that image was false when it was first devised, and it's almost non-existent now. The, the realities of the corporate publishing world is pretty grim. Most of them are going down the tubes until they figure out whatever, what they can do that maybe isn't quite like publishing, but it will somehow they'll survive. In their heyday, they built these fabulous buildings that housed them floors and floors of editors and people working for them, and all that's now uh, an overhead that's terribly burdensome. So what's happened is a lot of the publishers uh, are no longer independent. They've all been bought up by 
single owners who own vast conglomerates of publishers. And they have a kind of independence, but not a real independence. So when you submit a book, let's say, to a, a publisher, like, say, to Knopf, for example, you are, in effect, also submitting it to a dozen other publishers who belong to the same group. And if the Knopf guy doesn't want it, it's pretty hard to appeal to anybody else in that group, uh, unless you've got a really close friend somewhere. But typically, that means your day is over amongst 10 or 12 different publishers who we all used to be independent. A lot of that independent, pre those independent presses get swallowed up by a big publisher and then simply discontinued. We remember from our day, presses like Dial Press, for example, a lot of them that were there, were bought by a, another press and then just simply eliminated so they had less competition. Meanwhile, they depend pretty heavily on chain bookstores and the chain bookstores are also dying. They're disappearing. And the independents have been dying for a long time, making a comeback now a little bit because there isn't anybody else around selling books. So uh, it, it's the part of that whole uh, thing we were talking about earlier today about the move to the digital world and how that's uh, affecting anything that's in the old analogic word, world. It's a kind of wonderful hobby. People still collect vinyl and play it on record players, but it's not the way uh, sound is moved around the world now. You, you download it, you don't buy anything in that sense, or buy objects. So, uh, uh, so the publishing world is changing really, really dramatically. There are still some magazines that have a certain cloud, and like when I had a couple of stories in the New Yorker, I got more letters than I'd gotten years of uh, publishing. And so they still have a following and, a, and they pay well, et cetera. But these are, they're, drift, they're di disappearing. And uh, some of them, like Atlantic Monthly, just stop publishing any fiction or anything like literature. They, it, they have to make their money some other way. So uh, uh, that shrinking away of the market, and it makes everybody a bit more desperate than to get what uh, little remains. And for, mo for the most part, they're only interested in two things. They're interested in a proven bestseller, because that's how they survive as a company or uh, an unpublished writer, because you never know, you can always take a chance for one book on anybody. So they buy all these, uh, that the, the first book writers nowadays have a much better shot at a big contract, uh, not only than the first book writers of other generations, but of anybody else. I mean, a, a first book author is much more likely to get a decent advance and a lot of promotion for his book than anybody who's already published, no matter if they're well known. So most uh, writers who have not proven uh, to, to the world that they, are, they, they can make money for the publisher in a serious way are uh, pretty much, uh, uh, they've pretty much lost their connection there. There's not anybody going to be interested in picking up somebody who hasn't shown, no matter how good they are, no matter what, what their name is and what they've done, they're not going to be very interested in picking up someone who doesn't have a track record of, of selling a lot of books because that's what it is. It's a big business and it's corporately owned. So filling up this gap in terms of how literature survives have been the small presses and the small independent bookstores, and they struggle terribly, as you know. Uh, you know, if you don't have money here to bring in to help the ABR, you can't, you can't sell that enough copies to make it survive. So it needs patronage. And that's kind of true also. Small presses, I, every year I get requests for donations. You know, they're, they're presumably money-making presses, they presumably are choosing books, selling them, and getting something back, but it's not enough, and so they're asking all the writers, readers, to please, you know, send a Christmas check. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a difficult and, and awkward time. Uh, if if a if a book, make, a book publisher ha does have patronage, like university presses have patronage to the extent that they can convince anybody that they should publish fiction and not academic books. As long as you can hang on to that, there is a kind of publishing possibility because those books, the thing about most terrific writing, the writing that we really want to read, we really want to have and want to have as part of our national tradition, tends not to sell a lot on the day. It sells a lot over time. So we would, say like James Joyce, did not ever have a bestseller, but in a way that nobody has sold more books over the era of you know, just by the constant reputation. So 
few publishers are interested in worrying about that kind of long-range thing. The, one of the few is Grove Press. And that was thanks to Barney Rossett's decision, Barney now dead, and who knows what's going to happen. Well, he hasn't been in charge for a while anyway, but I mean that kind of motivation that, uh, that we'll keep everything in print and that uh, the, everything is here forever. That whole motivation is, is vanishing from most places. Most books have very brief life. They come out, sometimes they don't even come out. They come out in uh, review forms, uh, advanced galleys and so on, and shipped around. If they don't get a good response, they just don't bring the book out. So uh, it's, a, it's a tough time. Uh, and I'd say it's worst for writers who've had a book, or maybe two books out, and they didn't sell well, but who may be very fine writers. Uh, it, there's very few places they can go. They are the independent presses. You get nothing, and you have to sell your own book now. Uh, when, when I began, publishers gave you an advance, sent you on a bit of a tour, got some in interviews with radio and TV, and um, were delighted to do all that. And meanwhile, as an author, you pretended to be totally disinterested in any of that and stayed away as much as you could, um, and uh, only reluctantly accepted. Now, young authors l literally go on the uh, hustings themselves alone. I mean, they, they pay their own way. They get, they get bookstore readings, and they go there buying their own travel transport, and they ask the publisher to please send some books to the bookstore, and the book, they say, well, send a few because they don't trust they're going to sell many, so they don't even send a lot of books. Um, so it's a, it's a struggle now for, um, for the author who comes along trying to... It, what you do when you publish now is you get somebody to to actually put it on paper, but from then on, it's your job to, to get that around to somebody. And reviews, it's, it's, things are, in a way, changing. Uh, in, there are good things that are happening. One is that the print media no longer dominate the, uh, the review uh, uh, media. So print is not, the, I mean, New York Times still has a lot of clout. It doesn't do anything serious. Mainly publishes, uh, reviews books by publishers who give them some money, but uh, it has a certain believability. People read the New York Times book review. But for the most part, books now are, uh, interest in books is generated online. Various websites that get trusted as having interesting places to talk about books. When you're talking about doing an electronic version here, that's, I think, a very important aspect now because um, a lot of readers no longer bother with print. Print costs money. Um, down, on downloading the reviews and so on can be free. So you can read uh, about books before you buy them now. Better to do that online probably than try to find paper versions, which anyway, because of the way print works, comes out so much later than it's useful. Uh, but it's a thorny issue. And I've been, I'm suffering right now that thorniness because uh, I've had a long and quite successful career the uh, books here are now out with Penguin Classics. And uh, so I tried to get Penguin to buy my, in England, to buy my a new book. It's a tough one. It's tough. It's a sequel to the Brunus. And it's 400,000 words long, which is about 1,000 pages or so. So it's not easy to sell to anybody. And they said, yeah, they, they would like to do this. But first, I have to sell it in America. And they weren't going to go to the expense of, you know, setting the type or whatever they have to do. That can be done by somebody else and they can just borrow it. Um, and finding that, that press is hard. I just finished a revision. Uh, I finished in August, but I've been so busy I haven't been able to do anything. Now I'm, now I'm fiddling with it. We're beginning to send it out again. And I uh, just wrote, a, before I came here, I wrote a note to my agent about where we're going to do that. And we're thinking more and more about the online publishers, the one, not necessarily to do it that way, but to have access to it, because uh, that's how people buy books and, and how they read them and buy them. Yeah, it's an interesting time to get, you know, I, I, what an MS in publishing now is apt to be about. It's actually about a lot of controversy and a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, in the old days, it was very easy to tell how you worked with a publishing house or how you worked with a magazine and what your editorial jobs might be and so on. It's not like that now. It's all uh, dealing with, even if you don't go there, it's dealing with the electronic media, which operate in such a different way. Uh, 
I don't know, it's probably over long-winded, but if I've left anything out that you want to know. So it's a new thing, right? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the new new. It's a new new. All right, well, let's thank uh, Robert Cooper for sharing. Thank you.